Well, good morning. Praise the Lord. Today we're going to be talking about trust in God, the power of joy. Several months ago, in the middle of a very challenging trial, I was reading in Proverbs, and I came across this uh, scripture in Proverbs 24. It says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. And as I was reading that, I was thinking about the challenge that I was in the midst of. And so I began to question myself. How did I do? In the midst of this adversity, did I faint? Did I have strength? Where was I? And as I thought about it and, uh, and looked at my reaction to the challenge and different things like that, I, I saw that there was some mixture there. In some ways, there was a lot of strength as I was trusting God uh, in the midst of it. In other ways, uh, maybe a little fainting in the midst of that particular trial. So as I contemplated this and got to thinking about it, and, and as the Lord began to minister to me, it began to develop. And it's like, well, if we're supposed to have strength, what does that look like? What does strength that is big look like? So as I began to contemplate on that and to pray about it and to begin to look at other scriptures, what the Lord began to show me was that where the strength comes from is our trust in God. And the more that I thought about trust in God and what that what that is like and how that uh, progresses in our lives, what I began to see was that out of that trust, there was joy. Because there is a confidence, a confidence in God because we are trusting Him. And what that is, what that confidence is, is a joy. So that's what I want to talk about this morning, is Trusting God, which is the power of joy. In these days, it is time to take another look at joy. To many, joy seems more like happiness based on good circumstances. Wow, things went really well. That business deal happened. Uh, you know, my kids are doing great. Um, whatever it might be, and we may f feel some uh, what we might call joy, but really what that is is happiness, because the circumstances look really good. Everything's working out. That's great. But what happens when adversity comes? It's like, oh my, oh my God, what, what's going on? What am I going to do? How do I? And you be, immediately begin to see that the what you thought was joy that you were experiencing was actually just happiness based on circumstances. To some, it is an emotion that they're trying to work up. I know I'm supposed to be joyful. I know I'm supposed to be. How, how, how can I do that? How, how do I make that happen? How, how do I get to you know thinking happy thoughts and try to build up this joy? To others... It is an elusive emotion that they used to have, but now has faded into fear or hopelessness or complacency. In other words, the circumstances of life have begun to drown out the, uh, the sense of trust and faith and confidence in God and that joy begins to just fade. But one thing I began to, as I was doing this, was I began to realize that, you know, I have in here an emotion. It's an emotion. You know, I, 
I didn't really like using that word, but I couldn't come up with a better one at the time. Not, not a word. I mean, I could come up with some descriptive phrases, but I wanted something a little bit more concise. And, and emotion kind of says it, but it doesn't really say what joy is, because joy is not really an emotion like, like happiness or, or anger or frustration. It's, it's, it's not really an emotion like that, because joy comes from a different place. You don't have to feel happy to be joyful, because it's not really an emotion, it's a confidence in God. If the joy of the Lord is to be our strength, in order to be overcomers, and we've talked about this before, to be overcomers in these last days, it seems like we should know more about what joy is and how to walk in it. And this is what the Lord gave me. Joy is the overflow of our deep trust in God. His love his goodness, and his power. So therefore, joy is our strength, our rock, our fortress in the midst of every adversity. In the midst of every adversity. It's been said, you don't really know yourself until you've been tested. When we look at that scripture in Psalm 24, again, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. The contrary to that, the opposite of that, if you stand strong in the day of adversity, then your strength is great. So ask yourself, when adversity comes into my life, a situation doesn't work out, all of a sudden the finances turn upside down, you get a report from the doctor that is contrary to what you were expecting. Is your strength small? Is your strength great? Do you faint? Do you stand strong? These are questions we need to ask ourselves. I'm uh, I want to talk about someone that I know and that I love deeply. I have seen this person in the midst of adversity. I mean the kind of adversity that most people would, would cause their face to go white. And I have seen this person stand strong in the midst of some tremendous adversity. I have, because of that, been taught and encouraged by that person. Because of their strength, because of their Trust in God. It has helped me. And I'm talking about my wife, Penny. She is an amazing woman of faith. Many of you see her as joyful and loving and strong, which she is but she has been through a lot and, a, and over 
time. Not just quick little things, but some deep things. But she is an amazing woman of faith and strength. She got that way because of her trust and her faith in God over a period of time. And I want to talk about that in an illustration. Because it says there, if, you're, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. In other words, there's, there's a, an adversity comes and there's a breaking that happens. And one way of looking at, at, uh, at that, an illustration that I've uh, been following and, and thinking about in the way of this is in the area of uh, metallurgy. In other words, the tempering of steel. See, steel, or, which is really iron ore mixed with some other materials, some other metals, iron ore is very hard, extremely hard. But the problem with just uh, untempered steel is that it is brittle. In other words, you put a certain amount of force against a piece of untempered steel, and it will break. Many years ago, I had a 66 Mustang. I loved that car. It was actually my first car that I'd ever owned. And, uh, you know, back in those days, you know, having a Mustang was a pretty cool thing, especially a, a vintage one like, like that one. And one t day, I noticed that there was some water leaking and it needed a new water pump. So, I, knowing, having done that before, I knew what I was doing. I, I got a water pump. I started to take the bolts out of the water pump. And as I was doing it, one of the bolts came out kind of funny. And when I pulled it out, I realized what had happened. It had broken off. And I thought, uh-oh, that's not going to work. And uh, so I ended up taking it to a, uh, the dealership, and they were supposed to drill it out and uh, replace that bolt and put it all back together. Well, it, it was a mess. I don't want to go into all that, but anyway, there was a problem with it. So anyway, the idea is that that bolt, which was untempered, broke. And that's why in many applications, especially in construction, and Michael, I think, can uh, bear this out, you want to use tempered steel, especially if you're building a skyscraper and you've got those steel girders put together by these big, huge bolts and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and supports and that kind of stuff, you want that steel tempered. Because when there is you know, stories and stories of weight sitting on those girders, you don't want the girders failing because some little bolt busted. So you want to have tempered steel. Now what tempering does is through heat and time, time of heat exposure, it actually strengthens it because it makes it more flexible. So the, the putting of heat actually causes strength in the steel. I want to read to you um, from a metal metallurgical point of view, I think that's the way you would pronounce that word, about strength. Resistance to permanent deformation and tearing. Strength in metallurgy 
is still a rather vague term, so it usually is divided into yield strength. Strength beyond which determination becomes permanent. In other words, uh, so you would have a rod and you're putting pressure on it to try to, to try to bend it. And when it gets to that point where it gives and it becomes now deformed and bent, you know, let me give you a little little hint about something. You know, you see these strong men and they take these steel bars and they bend them. Well, <laughs> because of the way you temper steel, the more you temper it, in other words, the higher the heat or the more heat um, or the, the a given heat, and then you vary the time in which it's exposed to that heat, what happens is the more flexible it becomes. So sometimes what those guys have done is they've gotten some metal, but it is tempered so much that the it doesn't have that type of strength that keeps it from uh, deforming. So it looks like, man, they've got this, you know, inch and a half piece of, of metal here, and they're bending it right in half. Well, you get the right kind of material, the right type of tempering, and it becomes like a paper clip. You know, a paper clip that bends and stuff? That's because it has so much, has had so much heat applied to it over a period of time that it becomes flexible. That's why it doesn't break, because it, it's, uh, it's more and more flexible. So, anyway, going back to what we're talking about. So, um, that's one aspect. Another aspect is tensile strength. In other words, so it won't uh, tear. Another one is what they call... Um, hold on a second here. What they call shear strength. In other words, for it resists being cut. So that's why you get a padlock... And if that padlock has a stemper, tempered steel um, hasp on it, um, then that makes it more difficult for somebody to use a pair of bolt cutters to open it. So the fact that it's been tempered makes it stronger to avoid being able to, uh, to, to, uh, to cut it. Um, and then there is compressive strength, so that... Uh, it won't compress when there's a load uh, put on it. So all these things have to do with tempering. And that really is what happens in our lives. If you look at James uh, chapter 1, uh, Pastor talked about this a little bit on, uh, on Friday. James chapter 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, trials, tests, knowing this, that the trying of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing or lacking nothing. If you consider in this uh, scripture here that the trials are equal to the heat, and that patience is equal to the time, then you begin to see here what is happening. Because as the heat of trials, the heat of temptation, the heat of, of uh, tests in our life, as that heat is intensified, and then as it is then over time, in other words, patience, as you remain in patience in the midst of that heat, what it does is it tempers you. You begin to realize God can be trusted. I'm putting my trust in Him, and the more I put my trust in Him, the stronger that you become, so that in the end, become perfect and entire, lacking nothing. What does that mean? That means you can stand up against any trial, temptation that comes your way. Now, that is what happens. But what I want you to not do with this is to say, oh, that's why these trials came, because God gave me this trial in order to temper me. No, that is not right. 
if you go on into James, you'll see, starting in, in verse 13, that it says that God is not tempted with evil, neither does he tempt. And it's the same word, tempt, try, or test. Neither does God tempt, try, or test any man. But every man is tested, tried, and tempted by his own lusts. And when he gives in to those lusts, then that is what is causing that. So never think, oh, this thing I'm going through, God is trying to teach me something here. God is trying to temper me. No, what happens is, through our own desires, through the things that we accept, through the things that we put in, uh, allow in our lives, we get have trials and temptations and tests, and as we resist those things, we can, as we resist those things, we can um, be strong and tempered by the Lord. Now, one other thing I want to point out that Apostle Joshua had said on Friday, he talked about uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, uh, that, uh, and the last verse of that, which is faith, hope, and love. These three, and the greatest of these is love. And then he began to tie them back together. He said, love is the primary. Because of our love of God and because of his love for us, we begin to see uh, what he can do for us. And that bursts hope, a confident expectation. And from that confident expectation, that, that blueprint, then faith is born. And in the bearing of that uh, faith, um, then added to that is patience. Patience, which is enduring over time. So love to hope to faith and then to patience. But here's the exciting part. The next step is joy. Because part of the definition of our patience is a joyful endurance. So out of God's love, through hope, through then our faith in God, and the patience in the midst of that faith, joy then is born. Because it's a joyful endurance, because we know that God is going to see us through. So my, my sermon today is very simple. And that is, we want to build strength. We build strength by trusting God. Trusting God because of his love, because of his goodness, and because of his power. And as we are trusting God, the result of that, what comes out of that, is joy. The outflow is joy. And because of joy, then we can overcome and are, have strength, we are, uh, joy is our rock, and joy is our fortress. Now, the word strength that is used in that verse there in Proverbs 24.10 means vigor or force. Uh, strength is a good word for that, but it comes from us. It comes from internal in us. But look at number two there, Psalm 37, verse 39. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Now that particular word strength means a fortified place or a defense. So God is our strength. And as we draw up on that strength of who he is, it helps then to strengthen us so that when adversity comes, our strength can be great. And we can grow in that tempering of our lives. In Matthew 13, 20 through 21, 
and also verse 23, this is about the parable of the, so, uh, the sower, and Jesus is here unfolding that to his disciples. And this has to do with the second soil. So the word of God is sown into the heart, and it falls on either a hard path, a hard stone, it falls onto rocky places, it falls into um, places where there are weeds, or it falls on good ground. So this has to do with the one of uh, this rocky ground or the stony places. He that received the seed into stony places, received the word of God, the same as he that hears the word, and immediately with joy he receives it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but he endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. And that word means he is tripped up. The reason is because he doesn't have a foundation in himself. The, the word has not taken root in him. But then look at verse 23. This is about the good ground. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that hears the word. Same thing, hears the word and understands it. That is the key, and understands it. That means that one is doing the word. One has heard it, one understands, and taken into account what to do with that word. And so now they are doing the word. And then that word that he is doing then bears fruit and brings forth some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. Okay, going on. Matthew seven, twenty four through twenty seven. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. So just what we were talking about from Matthew thirteen. I will liken him unto a wise man. I want you to catch that, wise man. We're going to see that come up a couple of times in this teaching today. A wise man, which built his house upon a rock, and the rains descended, the floods came, the wind blew, and beat against that house, and it fell not. So in the day of adversity, this house did not fall. Why? It was founded on the rock, and that rock was the Word of God, but not just the Word itself, but doing the Word of God. And he goes on, Every man that heareth these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man. And he went through the same trial. The floods, the rain, the wind that beat upon the house, but this house fell. If thou faint, in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. So this man had little strength because it wasn't based on the Word. Psalm 43, verses 2 through 5. God of my strength. And that particular word there is also uh, referring to a fortress. Thou art the God of my strength. O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. See, he's talking now about revelation. He's talking about the truth of God's word. He's saying to God, O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me into the holy hill, into thy tabernacle. In other words, into relationship with God. Then I will go to the altar of God unto my God, my exceeding joy. Because he has heard the word, because he has heard God's truth, because he has seen and gotten revelation of who God is, God became to him his exceeding joy. And upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. And then he speaks to himself, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Look who you're talking about here. Look who we're praising. Why are you disquieted within me? Why is there frustration? Why is there worry and fear going on? Why, 
<clears throat> oh soul, are you disquieted? Trust in God, hope in God. For I shall yet praise him who is my, the health of my countenance and my God. Now the health of my countenance. In other words, in the midst of a trial, there's a smile on our face. But where does that smile come from? It's not a smile on our face. It starts as a smile in our heart. And the smile in our heart then becomes the smile on our face. Because we have a confidence in God. And in the midst of this trial, <laughs> we're strong. Because we have been tempered. We know that God is good. We know that God is love. We know that God is powerful. And He will see us through the trial that we are going through. Look at the description of the righteous man in Psalm 112. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance, remembrance of God and what he has done. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees the desire upon his enemies. In other words, until he sees the victory that he is expecting. Now, nearly every scripture, especially these last couple ones that we've read, and we're going to read several more, are all from the Old Testament. I mean, these are men and women that don't even have the spirit of the living God living in them. How much more should our strength in God? Should our hope in God, should our trust in God, and therefore our joy in God be exemplified in our lives? Now, underlying a lot of teaching on joy, and, and even this teaching, is this scripture from Nehemiah. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It comes from Nehemiah Chapter 8, verse 10. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those whom, for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now we read that scripture and we say, Yeah, great, the joy of the Lord is our strength. You know, be happy, eat Eat fat. In other words, uh, eat the good part of the, of the uh, meat. You know, drink the sweet, that which is you know, good to drink. But let's kind of look at the context here a little bit. I want you to see this. Starting in verse, uh, there in uh, Nehemiah 8, starting in verse 7. Also, Jeshua, and all those other people, I'm not going to read all those names, and the Levites, caused, listen to this, caused the people to understand the law. That's what Nehemiah had been doing. He was reading the people, to the people, the law of the Lord that had been lost. Generations had gone by and they had not heard the word of God. They had not heard the law of God. <clears throat> So, uh, they caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in, that, in their place. So, they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, gave the sense what it was about, caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah um, and Ezra, the priest the scribe and the Levites that taught the people and said unto the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the word of the law. Why were they weeping? Why were they mourning? Because they heard the law 
and they realized that their lives were not in sync with God's word, not in sync with God's law. They were struck. It's like, oh my gosh, look at this. Look at what the word says and look what I'm doing. They were in mourning that they had not kept the word of the Lord. What Ezra is saying to them is, yes, that might be true, but look at what's happening today. Today you are hearing the Word of God. Today you are understanding it. Today you're getting a sense of what it's all about and how you need to be living. So this is not a day to be, to be mournful. This is not a, bit, a day to weep. This is a day to rejoice because now you are hearing the Word of God. And because you are hearing the Word of God, it's a holy day unto the Lord. So let's feast. Let's give to those who are, are lacking. And let the joy of the Lord be your strength because it's based on the Word of God. Now, going on, Proverbs 24, verse 5. Notice this is the same chapter as Proverbs 24, 10. In Proverbs 24, 5, it says, A wise man is strong, yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. And that word is the same word that's used in verse 10, about vigor or force or internal strength. A wise man is strong, talking about the same, the same thing, yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. You want to know how to increase your strength in the midst of adversity? A man of knowledge, a man of wisdom. In other words, you are hearing and doing the Word of God. And we, we know this. We've heard this. John 8, 31 through 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In other words, the truth will allow you, cause you to overcome the adversity that the circumstances of life have brought up that are against the word of God. So the more that you are continuing in the Word, the more strength that you are receiving as a, as a wise man, as a, as a man of knowledge, increasing in knowledge, you're going to increase in strength. Knowledge, understanding of what God has done for us and how then to walk in it. This morning I read at the opening Psalm 18 and... This is a great psalm. As I've studied this, as I've, I've read it over and over again and, and studied it, I am just amazed. Here is David, the king of Israel. David, a man after God's own heart. This is at the end of his life. It's recorded originally in 2 Samuel chapter 22. If you go to 2 Samuel 22... And, and then also open to Psalm 18, you'll see it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. But it's, it's 2 Samuel 22. It's at the end of David's life. It says that uh, he had been given peace over all his enemies. And it's at the end of his life. And he is reflecting on all that has transpired, all that God has done. So many things have happened uh, with him fighting the Philistines with him and his dealing with Absalom and, and all the things that went on there. This is at the very end of his life. And he is giving praise to God for who he is. And I just, I just love this because he is proclaiming who God is. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Notice how it's in the personal, the first person, my strength. I love the Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will rest. My 
my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be delivered from my enemies. And he understood that to his core, that he would be delivered from his enemies. Why? Because he had been delivered over and over and over and over again. Look what he has to say here. The sorrows of death compass me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. You can imagine David in the midst of the battle. Remember back then, battle was hand-to-hand combat. Swords and spears and, and shields. And he's battling, battling the Philistines in the midst of battle. He at times probably felt afraid. He'd look around and he'd just see a bunch of Philistines all coming at him. What was he going to do? He says, The sorrows of hell encompassed me about. The snares of death uh, prevented me or, or stopped me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and I cried unto my God, and he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. And then what happened? All heaven broke loose. Look at this, verse 7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also moved and were shaken because he, talking about God, because God was wroth. Then went up smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth. Uh, devoured coal, coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly He did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion around about were dark waters and thick clouds and brightness. Can you just see this? All heaven broke loose because of of David's prayers. And then I'm going to skip down to verse 16. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They... uh, Hand me in. They prevented me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Now, it wasn't just that God uh, just came down and and plucked him out and delivered him because he he just kind of like plucked him out of the situation or he he, uh, knocked down all the people around him. No. You go on to verse 29. He says, for by thee I have run through a troop, my, um, and by my God I have leapt over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to those who trust in him. Um, I'm going to skip down now to, let's see, verse 33. He maketh my feet like hinds feet. He setteth me upon my high places. He teaches my hand to war. He has given me the shield of salvation, and his right hand has held me up. In other words, it wasn't that God just came down and just wiped everything out. What God did was gave him what he needed to overcome. He strengthened him. He taught him how to war. He gave him uh, the ability to run through a troop. In other words, all these people all around him that are coming at him, and he just, time to go ran right through him, ran through the truth, leapt over a wall. So he, God gave him the strength to do what was needed for him to be able to overcome. So that's why he could say, my God is my rock. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God. He had seen him do it over and over again. Did David 
If, if something came up against him, did he fear? No, because he knew his God. He was tempered, and he knew. So in the day of adversity, he wasn't going to faint. No, he had strength. Amen. Amen. Growing in joy. Joy comes from trusting God, our strength. Isaiah 12, 1, and, 1 through 3. And in that day, thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away. And thou confronted me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw waters out of the wells of salvation. Amen. Amen. We rejoice in God greatly. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He has clothed me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorned. So we see here, we rejoice greatly because of who God is. God is our strength, and therefore our hearts shall rejoice. Look at this in Psalm 28, verses 7 and 8. The Lord is my strength. And he's talking there using the word about force. And my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I shall praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. As we learn to trust God, because we see who he is, we know his word, we know his goodness, his love, his power, we can put our trust fully in him. We can put the full weight of our being in him so that no matter what adversity comes against us, no matter what the evil one throws at us, we have strength. We shall not faint, but, be, but we are flexible in the sense that we have strength. We are not brittle and break under adversity. But we have been tempered by the Word of God. We have been tempered by our, um, by the trials that we have been through and by the uh, patience that we have had during that trial. And in the midst of that, we are strengthened. Now, Metallurgy is a very precise formula of, of how to get the steel, or the metal that you're working with, to get it to exactly what performance you want it to perform. But where it starts is what is the metal made up of. In other words, it starts with an iron ore, but then different things are added to it. Different types of other metals are added to it, which helps to give it more strength. So depending on what you want the outcome to be, it starts with what materials do you want to use. And I liken that to, to us. In other words, there can be heat and there can be time, but if what is in us is not the right material, the tempering will not, the tempering of those trials will not produce what God has called us to be or to do or to overcome. So you get that, you get that in you by the Word of God. As you uh, study the Word of God, as you learn the Word of God, as you speak the Word of God, then it becomes strength to you. Um, it becomes uh, the type of metal that when 
the heat and the and the time is applied and you are being tempered, you come out then perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, you are fulfilling what God has called. So, spend time in God's Word. Spend time with God. Learn to understand who He is. See His love. See His goodness. I was watching a movie lately, and in it, a man had lost his son in a tragic accident. He was, I think his son was like 11 or 12. And he, not just he, but the people around him kept saying, why did God take my son from me? Why did God take my grandson from me? Why did God, you know, I trusted him. I've trusted him. I've trusted him. Why did he take him from me? Why did he take him from me? Well, I want you to realize, you know, that, that's an often normal or uh, maybe religious response to adversity that comes into our life. Why did God do this? Why did God take, you know, take my job from me? Why did God have all these things happen? But that's not understanding the truth of the Scripture. Because God is good. And every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, in whom there is no shadow of turning. He is light, and we are to walk in the light. So, adversity comes. Notice that James says, when... When you encounter. He's not saying if. He's not saying there's a way out of that. He says when the trials come. When the temptations, the trials, and the tests come. Then this is what you do. You, it says, I know this. Knowing this, that's the shrine of your faith. So we want to have in us what we need. So that when the trials and tests come, we know it's not God doing it. We're trusting Him. You can't trust a God who you think is going to take stuff from you. No, what you do is you trust God who is good. And when the trials and temptations come from your own lusts or from the the enemy using your lusts against you, your lusts, your fears, all these things, he tried to use those against you, then you are going to stand strong. So trust in the Lord. Going back to our definition or our working definition of joy. Joy is the outflow of our deep trust in God. His love, His goodness, and His power. Joy is our strength our rock, and our fortress in the midst of every adversity. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Matthew. Wow. Awesome. Joy. Joy is, as we all know, part of the fruit of the Spirit, one of the nine fruit. It's a spiritual force that God put in us when we accepted Jesus. It's here. It's inside us. But it's like a muscle that needs to be developed. We need to recognize it. We need to put it into practice. We need to apply it. And what better time to apply joy is when things are very challenging. And it might seem like that's the least time when you'd want to have that joy emanate. But there's a saying that we've heard in the past called, fake it till you make it. 
that smile that Pastor Matthew talked about that's in our hearts needs to come out and be in our mouths. So even if we don't feel like it, we need to put that smile on our lips and let that joy come out and fill the fullness of it to emanate out from us. Because that joy is the joy of the Lord. He's filling us with his joy. And he's partnering with us to help us through everyday life, even the ordinary things, the good things, the bad things, the ordinary things. That joy should be part of our lives every single day. Thank you for those scriptures you pointed us to. I don't know about you, but I found them very encouraging and uplifting. So hopefully you did too. And with that, let's go to the communion table. And let's, with the joy in our hearts, come before our God and thank our Jesus for this privilege of being able to receive ongoing from his broken body and from his shed blood. Because this happened a long time ago, and yet his body and his blood have never lost their power and never will. He's made the benefits of his sacrifice available to us every single time we partake. And he put no limitations as many times as we want. It's there available for us. So let's confess our sins and let's get our selves in proper alignment to come to this holy communion. Let's take a moment. We thank you, Lord, for your word that tells us that on that night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he said, take it, eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Your body was broken. You took upon yourself every sickness, disease, infirmity, and pain we can't even begin to imagine the pain and the torture that you went through for us so that we could be healed and healthy and whole and free from all of that junk that Satan wants to put on us. But we have the right because we belong to God through the blood of Jesus. We have that right to say, we've been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We are the healed of the Lord and we say so. In the name of Jesus, we fight the enemy with the word of God and with the power of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that belongs to us. It belongs to us. Let's take it now together in Jesus' name. We bless and sanctify the Lord and thank him so much that he gave his life for us. He poured out his blood, every last drop, pure, holy, powerful blood of Jesus Christ made available to us now, for the life is in the blood. And we, as we partake of the blood, see ourselves as flooded with the blood of Jesus, seeing it go through our entire being from head to toe, inside, outside, every cell, every fiber, every organ, every system, flooded with the blood of Jesus, every empty space in our bodies, flooded with the blood of Jesus and saturated with the life of God. Thank you, Lord, for making this available to us. Thank you, for that is our trust. We trust in your word. We know your word is true. We know that joy comes with the life. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us. We are when you, you are in us, and hand in hand we go forth together through our lives being victorious each and every day in your power. We thank you for the covenants and the promises that belong to us. Thank you that our sins have been washed away 
and if the sins, then also the wages of sin. We are righteous and right standing with God Almighty because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So now let's together in joyous thanksgiving partake of the precious cup of life, the precious cup of blessing in Jesus' name.